was a very kind of fast and challenging run, uh, covering several hundred years <laughs> in a short period of time. And, and once again, thank you very much for your the great insight to look into the, uh, the what has happened, what is going on, and what will happen in the future. And somehow I, uh, I felt both the, the scent of optimism and pessimism in, in uh, your speech. And, but all of a sudden, was well, I don't know why, but uh, I, all of a sudden I just yeah, remember one familiar, yeah, the name of a poem, The Road Not Taken. Because <laughs> we, well, in, in a world full of surprises, and we have to walk into the new road. Maybe one road may look familiar. The other one may look unfamiliar. And sometimes we are wondering which way to go, some familiar path or some unfamiliar path leading to the new reality, new normal, and, and the new future. And we never know what lies ahead. But, well, maybe the yeah, long, long after, ages and ages hence, somewhere the, we may, if we look back into the present, the present situation, then was well, I'm, I'm quite curious how we can the, uh, clarify the current situation and, and our decision at, at this moment. So with that, the, uh, the hint of the, the literary note, I, uh, I have a couple of, of like the, some couple of questions maybe as well, as, as an introduction, maybe some, some sort of ice breaking of seven, eight hundred years. And then, uh, and then I will open the floor and, and I will get the, the, well, I will deliver some question from the, from the floor to you. Uh, my, the, the first question is, uh, we have seen a series of new conflict. Well, so some familiar conflict and some unfamiliar conflict. For example, the, uh, the U.S.-China uh, trade competition and other kind of more, more like geopolitical the conflict it is one thing. Familiar Middle Eastern conflict. And also, well, in, in many parts of the world, we are seeing the, uh, all different kinds of, of conflict. And my question is, to what extent they are man-made? That means that could, w which will be reversible with new policy and new governance. And to what extent are they structural? So, which means irreversible. We have to face the new, rea new realities and new normal. So, that will be my uh, first question. Um, let me talk a little bit about sort of patterns of conflict uh, in response to that, that question. I mean, the, the Cold War was at its heart a great power rivalry uh, between the United States and Soviet Union. That was its essence, and then it was manifest in lots of local conflicts in various parts of the world. Obviously, the war that was fought here on the Korean Peninsula, but also many other conflicts where one superpower or the other backed different factions. We never fought the Soviet Union directly. We fought uh, through various proxies, and this had uh, all sorts of repercussions in Asia, in Africa, even to some degree in Latin America and elsewhere. So the Cold War was basically a, a great power conflict. After the Cold War, of course, you couldn't have a great power conflict because there was really only one uh, global great power, the United States. But we saw a explosion of civil conflicts in a variety of places, in the Balkans, in parts of Africa, uh, in certain parts of the Middle East uh, more recently, whether it's Libya or Syria as well. And so the number of interstate wars has uh, declined rather sharply, but the number of inter internal wars has increased. Um, and what we discovered also is that trying to 
address those internal conflicts, whether in Iraq or Afghanistan or elsewhere, is extraordinarily difficult. These tend to last a long time, very difficult for outside powers to deal with. But what the world is reverting back to, I believe, is essentially a return to great power rivalry in a variety of different ways. We certainly see this with the emerging competition between the United States and China. I think we also see that in what's happened between uh, Russia and the United States, Russia and Western Europe, Russia and its relationship uh, with China. Uh, let me emphasize that I believe Russia is very much a declining power. Uh, just as one example of that, the Russian economy is smaller than the Italian economy. Right? It's smaller than the Canadian e economy. Uh, nobody is lining up to buy the latest Russian smartphone. Right? Um, it has some capabilities. It has some military capacity, particularly close to its own borders. But uh, Russia is not the wave of the future, even though Vladimir Putin has played a rather weak hand very well and understands the sort of uh, great power uh, game as well. Now, the question was, is this a sort of man-made situation? Well, all human conflict is man-made, or uh, we create them in one form or another. You couldn't have them uh, without human beings. But the taproot of all of these for people like me is uh, the fact that we live in a world where there is no effective world government to prevent states from competing with each other and sometimes fighting and therefore every state has to provide security for itself. It can try and do so in part by relying on allies but you can't be entirely confident in your allies so countries that worry about their security and all countries have to have to have some capabilities themselves. This encourages countries and especially great powers to compete for power and influence, to try and weaken their rivals, to try and do more themselves. And sometimes that competition spins out of control. All right? Sometimes people make mistakes, they miscalculate. Two great powers are convinced the other is irrevocably hostile, but also easy to defeat, and so they get into a, a war. Because that possibility never goes away completely, you end up with conflicts. And that's the structural part, that I don't think there's any complete and 100% reliable solution for. So, yes, well, we cannot prevent the human mistakes. And well, sometimes they, they make good judgment. And, but, but, well, so that, may lead to my dear the next question well if we narrow the focus okay so who made the uh, who do who does the thing in, in a right way or a wrong way and uh, if we just focus on the u.s foreign policy and u.s foreign policy especially to let's say toward northeast asia including china okay then uh well well, so I, I'm, I'm, I'm not intending to mention about the specific person or, or, or but the, uh, in, in general, okay, do you think the United States, U.S. foreign policy toward Northeast Asia is, is heading toward the which path? And the Korean people like the multiple choice. So I, I will give you four sets of question, uh, four, four sets of answer. That will make it easier. The answer number one, the U.S. is doing the right thing here in a right way. Answer number two, U.S. is doing the right thing, but in a wrong way. Answer number three, U.S. is doing the wrong thing, but in a right way. And lastly, this is doing the wrong thing in a wrong way. <laughs> and those are my only choices? <laughs> yes. Yeah. I think it's pretty clear that the United States is doing number two. We're doing the right thing, but we're doing it very much in the wrong way. And I'll, uh, I'll unpack that a little bit. 
Uh, I think the Trump administration, uh, like the Obama administration and like the Bush administration, understands that China is the major security challenge here in Asia for the United States, but also for our, uh, our various allies in Asia. They're very clear about that. And they are also correct in understanding that some of the things China has been doing uh, need to be opposed. Uh, that China has not lived up to its obligations in the World Trade Organization, not uh, entirely, that needs pressure uh, on that regard. That China's efforts to revise the status quo in places like the South China Sea uh, needs to be opposed. And in that sense, uh, they understand that they're doing the right thing to try and uh, stand up to China. But they're doing it in the wrong way. Uh, if you wanted to... Uh, provide an effective balancing coalition against China in Asia, you would have stayed in the Trans-Pacific Partnership and you would have worked very hard to get it through the Senate so it was officially uh, a treaty agreement. Uh, you would not have gone after China's trade practices all by yourself. You'd have done so in partnership with Japan and Korea and the European Union and Canada and other major industrial powers uh, instead, what the Trump administration did was go after China and also pick a fight with Korea and pick fights on trade with Japan and pick fights with trade uh, with the European Union. So our pressure on China has been less effective uh, than it could have been. So it, again, doing the right thing, but very much in the wrong way. I'll say another example of this. I believe it was not a mistake for President Trump to figure out in his first year as president that sending insulting tweets back and forth to Pyongyang was a bad idea, that threatening war was a bad idea, and that diplomacy was a good idea. So I don't think it was a mistake to reach out to North Korea and see if something could be done. But he did it in the wrong way. It was a mistake to believe that his personal charm would win over Kim Jong-un. It was a mistake to not prepare for the meetings. It was a mistake to believe that a couple of meetings would convince North Korea to abandon its entire nuclear program completely and irreversibly. This was an unrealistic goal pursued in a very inept, almost amateurish way. So I think it's quite clear that the Trump administration is trying to do the right thing but has been doing it pretty much in the wrong way. That's better than trying to do the wrong thing in the right way, but it's not ideal. All right, well, thank you very much. And, uh, well, well, and, and, well, I guess we have the, uh, this great audience, and, and I do see uh, many young students and, 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 and young scholars, and for many of them, well, it seems like there is somebody popping out of the textbook and, and syllabus and, and, and sitting in front of them. And, and as it was, and you've been known as, the, uh, as a realist, the, uh, the guru of, of, of realism, but uh, sometimes, sometimes we are also talking about not just multi, well, the, the great power competition or bilateral relations, but also, in, in this part of the world, in, in Northeast Asia, we are also talking about any kind of multilateral relations. And multilateralism is not essentially a liberal product. It also reflects the powers. So, how, in that sense, how do you foresee the prospect and the possibility of multilateralism? in Northeast Asia, it can be security, it can be trading con, or any kind of regional institutions. Thank you. Um, so I think that multilateralism is going to become more necessary uh, here in Asia. Uh, there's a pretty obvious comparison in security terms between the way in which security relations are organized in Europe and the way they're organized in Asia. And to oversimplify a little bit, you know, NATO is a multilateral institution. Uh, the United States is the most influential member, but every member of NATO has sort of equal voting rights, uh, etc. And they reach collective decisions. Sometimes that takes a long time. 
but it's a very much a multilateral situation where each member is equally committed to all of the other members. Uh, the security architecture in Asia has been different. It's been much more based on bilateral treaties with the United States, where we have relations with lots of countries in Asia, but it's between Washington and those particular capitals. There are some multilateral institutions in Asia, such as ASEAN, but they're not as extensive, not as deep in, in some respects, uh, or as consequential, in, in my view at least. Uh, I think over time, uh, we need to start thinking about a more robust security architecture here in Asia. I'm not saying creating an Asian version of NATO. It would, I think, probably have some different characteristics. But trying to encourage greater cooperation amongst different countries in Asia and not having everything run sort of through, uh, through Washington. And that's why the de recent developments between Japan and Korea are so worrisome because it's a step in the wrong direction if one is trying to move towards greater cooperation on security matters. Now, we have also, of course, wanted to build uh, multilateral uh, economic partnerships, and that's what TPP was all about. It was, of course, uh, the United States was going to be a critical part of that, uh, but it wasn't just bilateral relations or bilateral trade deals with the United States. It was a multilateral agreement. And as most of you probably know, the United States withdrew from it, but the other members have continued forward to build essentially a multilateral trading pact. Um, I would like to see more developments like that as well here in Asia, because I think that's going to reinforce a lot of the cooperation that will help maintain both a favorable balance of power in Asia, but also harmonious relations among different Asian countries. All right, thank you very much. And uh, I may add just one more of my comment question, and, uh, and, and then I will move to the floor side. I, I, I got the idea of this interesting the, the, the question. Okay, uh, but it seems like that, well, I don't expect many the floor participant, many participants will, will ask this question, but I think uh, this part of the world, not Asia, but will be quite critical in, in foreseeing the future of the world. That is the Middle East. Because uh, we, we have, yeah, the tra traditional tie, the, the alliance between the U.S., Saudi Arabia, and especially U.S., Israel, and uh, on on the one hand, and on the other hand, the U.S., the United States is is raising tension with Iran, and still Iraq is, is troublesome, and the tension in the Hormuz Strait is going up, and Korea, the South Korea. As a member of the U.S. ally, is being asked to send troops to the Hormuz Strait. Well, well, I'm not sure what, whether that will be realized in, in, in the near future, or what sort of the, the new new the phase will will come around. But uh, how do you foresee the future of the Middle Eastern geopolitics, or or, or the traditional pillars? Of, of alliance changing and and how the, the, the Iranian situation will be unfolded. What is the U.S. playbook, by the way? Um, so as I, as I briefly said in my remarks, I think the alliance uh, arrangements in the Middle East are actually much more fragile and delicate than they have been in a long time. And let me say several different things uh, about this. Uh, the principal American strategic interest in the Middle East has been, as with other parts of the world, to maintain a balance of power, to make sure that no single country was able to control that region. And the main reason we cared about that was because so much of the world's oil and gas was produced there. All right, and so we didn't want any single country to control all of it because that country would then have a lot of leverage on the world economy if they cut things off or if they raise the price. We didn't want the Soviet Union to seize the Persian Gulf. We didn't want any single Middle East country to control all of that. We wanted a balance of power, right? 
And so you will remember that when uh, the Shah of Iran fell in 1979, the United States created a rapid deployment force, created military forces that could go there, but we didn't put them there until 1990-91 when Iraq invaded Kuwait. We thought maybe Iraq would then try to push on to Saudi Arabia, and we decided to maintain a balance of power there. We had to uh, send forces and reverse that. Um, so that's been the major strategic goal. Now, the Middle East has never been more divided than it is today. It's divided along multiple dimensions. Several countries there, such as Syria, are essentially in ruins. There is no prospect of any country controlling all of the Middle East or controlling all of the Persian Gulf at present. Remember, the United States, the most, most powerful country, couldn't manage the Middle East after invading Iraq in 2003. If we couldn't do it, nobody else could. Iran is not going to dominate the region anytime soon. Israel isn't. Egypt isn't. Russia isn't. China isn't. It's going to be relatively easy to maintain a balance of power there. We don't have to be there with large forces in order to do that. Uh, second big point, the overall strategic importance of Middle East oil and gas is going down. That's partly because of the development of fracking and the great increase in oil and gas production in North America. It's also because of climate change and the fact that the world is going to have to start burning fewer fossil fuels or we're going to have much more serious problems than conflict in the Middle East. I'm not saying that oil and gas in the Middle East is not important at all, but its strategic importance is going to decline over time. Uh, that means the United States is not going to have to worry as much about the Middle East as it has in the past. Uh, finally, our policy towards Iran has been completely boneheaded. Right? It makes absolutely no sense from an American strategic perspective to be so hostile to Iran. The United States should not have special relations with a few countries in the Middle East and no relationship with Iran. By the way, by a special relationship, I mean one of unconditional American support, where we sort of let Middle Eastern countries do whatever they want knowing that the Americans will back them. That's the relationship we have with Egypt, the relationship we have with Israel, the relationship we have with Saudi Arabia. And it's increasingly clear that giving these countries unconditional support just leads them to do all sorts of foolish things. The other reason the United States should have a normal relationship with Iran and normal relations with other countries in the Middle East is that that would maximize American influence. When Secretary Pompeo flies to Riyadh, it would be better if the Saudis knew that he would leave Riyadh and his next stop was Tehran. And when he's in Tehran, I want the Iranians to know that his next stop after that is Tel Aviv. And then maybe he goes to Ankara or to Cairo. Why is that important? Because at each of those stops, the people he's talking to will have a reason to tell him things he wants to hear, to accommodate the things he's asking of them, because if they don't, maybe the people at his next stop will. By, by being too heavily tied to some countries and having no relationship with others, we actually undercut our own influence. Right? We're less influential in that part of the world than we might be. Uh, and again, I'm, it's not my business to tell South Korea uh, what to do, but I think it would be crazy for South Korea to send forces to the Middle East to confront Iran. It's not in your interest to do that. And please feel free to tell the American ambassador I said so. Uh, thank you very much. Well, the, uh, Certainly, no, I, yeah. I, I don't think he'll. I don't even know who the American ambassador is, but I doubt he'll listen. Okay. Yes. So, uh, actually, the uh, the rise of energy production in in the United States, the, the shale gas and shale oil, actually that gave a lot of lot more leverage. That energy independence gave, gave the U U.S. a lot of leverage 
to transform the Middle East Eastern policy from kind of more wider the uh, intervention to to a more selective intervention. So a lot of strategic, but somehow that made the, the equation even more complicated. Well, at least to to some countries, some to many other countries outside of the Middle East. Okay, uh, I have have a thick list of the question, but. Uh, but before opening the floor, uh, actually, I, I do see the great number of the great scholars and commentator. But I, uh, using the privilege of, of a moderator, so I would like to take uh, advantage of the presence of two person in in the floor. Actually. Uh, I, I, well, if, if it will be okay, then I would like to invite yeah, the former Prime Minister Yi Hong-gu for, for a brief comment, but not just as a Prime Minister, but as a renowned political scientist and, and, and a former professor from, from Seoul National University. So would, would you mind giving some of your thoughts? Thank you very much. <clears throat> I'm not very really well prepared. It's wonderful to hear your very concise summary of the uh, world history as well as the current situation. I uh, <clears throat> tend to agree with uh, almost everything you said. Uh, <clears throat> I have to say that the uh, <clears throat> 19th and 20th century was age of imperialism and particularly 20th century was uh, basically American century from our point of view. Two world wars ended only with the uh, U.S. involvement and U.S. leadership. And particularly in the second half of 20th century, U.S. was uh, predominant global power, it was a good thing because that saved at least Republic of Korea, South Korea. The war broke out in 1950, and it was our good fortune that U.S. was in that supreme position, and also you had a great president like Mr. Truman, who is a really American, who really embodied American traditional uh, virtue. So that saved us now. 1987-88, <clears throat> Korea had a transition to democracy after some of <clears throat> decades of authoritarian rule and military involvement. And in, as if we celebrate that transition, in 1988, we had the Seoul Olympics, which signified the end of what you call the first Cold War between the United States and Soviet Union then. So all in all, everything was moving along. And then we had maybe about 30 years of globalization period, globalization of market, and we benefited from it as well. I want to say that from my viewpoint, what we face today is revival of nationalism and decline of internationalism, which United States uh, <clears throat> led last century. And this time, that revival of nationalism has a special characteristic because it's not the so-called countries suppressed by imperialism who cried for independence, they were the front runners of the nationalism. But this time, it's the superpowers which is uh, really heading the uh, nationalistic survival or revival. In fact, for the last 
10 years or so, I have used the term, the major powers who have been influenced by what I call a nostalgia for empire. Now, U.S. is not an unusual empire. Nevertheless, what I see from Mr. The President and others in the United States today is uh, nostalgia for good old days when U.S. was absolutely preeminent. China officially declared that they were nostalgic for old China. So that's a China, Chinese dream Xi, Mr. Xi Jinping is talking about. And I think the, the, the position of Mr. Putin is relatively safe because of the revival of nostalgia for empire and the Russians like to see Russia remain kind of an empire. But all in all, I mean, uh, this is a big problem. And for example, the current problem between Japan and South Korea could also be explained in that terms. I'm not saying that Japan is trying to be a, go back to the imperial militarism of Second World War, pre-Second World War days. But nevertheless, Japan is the number three economic power in the world. And they also have their version of nostalgia for empire. On the other hand, South Korea, we have been a victim between China, Russia, and Japan. So unlike many other countries, we still are very much open to the old style nationalism that is try to protect ourselves from the great powers. So this kind of thing is uh, re-emerging in our part. Now finally, still we consider the United States is our hope that is, U.S. should play the leading role in resolving all these problems. And only problem, only thing we are worried about is that U.S. has changed a great deal in the last 30 years or so. Earlier you mentioned President Obama and others. In other words, they were trying to play a necessary part in Asia, but in speaking about the entire United States, it still remain basically consider itself an authentic nation. But the remarkable things have happened in the last 50 years or so. So Americans are increasingly realizing itself that it's located right between Atlantic and Pacific Oceans and should be, should play the role fitted to that special location and mission. And what we are hoping is that uh, come out May, the U.S. will regain its uh, old dreams and, and new aspirations and try to play a game which will combine Atlantic community with new Asian community and try to lead a development of new global order. That's maybe too much, but your, your speech provokes so, so many good ideas. I, I'm sure that after you leave, many of our scholars and particularly our young people will come up with uh, wonderful ideas. Thank you very much. Thank, thank you. Th those were wonderful comments. Uh, if I react very briefly, I just want to make sort of three points because you covered a, a lot of ground there as well. I mean, the first point is um, in the, uh, I appreciate what you said about the American role in the latter 
part of the 20th century, but I actually think our relationship with Korea has uh, lots of lessons to tell us about other things. Uh, Korea is an extraordinary success story in, in many different ways. Um, and the transition from uh, military rule to the current democracy you know, is by far mostly the achievement of the Korean people themselves with a little bit of help from the United States. The United States was encouraging this process, but very gently uh, for the most part. We didn't try to turn Korea into a US style democracy in 1955 or to do it in two or three years. Uh, this was something that we were rather patient on uh, for a variety of different reasons. And as a result, when the democratic transition happened, it was done by Koreans with their uh, full uh, support, uh, their design, they set it up, they didn't take orders from Washington. And I like democracy, I'm thrilled that I live in one. Uh, I want it to remain a democracy uh, uh, and a, an effective one that works well. Um, and I think the rest of the world, if it gradually becomes more democratic, it would be a good thing. But the key word there is gradually and at sort of each society's own speed. And this success story in Korea is an example of, of why I think that's right. I agree with you entirely about the resurgence of nationalism. And we should all remember that nationalism has you know, positive and negative features. <coughs> National pride and national unity has many great virtues in terms of maintaining harmony within a society, uh, getting us to sacrifice on behalf of other members of our society, the, the energy that can drive a great achievement. So uh, I don't think you can get rid of nationalism and we should appreciate its positive features. But nationalism has a dark side as well when it becomes xenophobia, the sort of fear of others, uh, when it becomes a sense of superiority, uh, a belief that one is uh, better than other countries and therefore has the right uh, to dominate uh, or rule them. Uh, and I completely agree with your point about nostalgia, that the, the nationalism we see reemerging in many places is all looking backwards. What was Donald Trump's slogan? make America great again, right? A return to what he thinks we used to be, right? Uh, what you see happening in Russia, what you see happening in Poland and Hungary are all looking backwards, uh, looking at some supposedly glorious past that you need to return to. Uh, Brexit is the same thing. It was you know, turning England back to something independent, the glory of England when it was a, a great empire. Uh, when you think about this, that's the last thing uh, a country should do to want to go backwards in time. It should try to be looking forward and figure how can we progress, how can we develop, how can we, uh, how can we move ahead. Um, and just to bring this back to the current dispute between Korea and Japan, this is a dispute based on the past, on uh, crimes that were committed decades ago. And I believe it would be a tragedy if that history, which should not be forgotten, nonetheless continued to cast a shadow on Korea's future and on Japan's future and their possible uh, cooperation uh, going forward. Um, let me stop there, but I, I appreciate your comments. I thought they were really very insightful. Thank you. Thank you very much. And also as a bridge to the next, the big set of question, I, well, I may invite the uh, former foreign minister, Yun yong -Gwan, and also this time as, as, as a uh, renowned IR scholar too. So, uh, may, may I ask a brief comment? Thank you very much, Professor Ward. Um, uh, I enjoyed your very insightful and uh, macro history overview and analysis of the current situation. Uh, somebody said that uh, it is very difficult to make a prediction when it is about the future. So, uh, certainly it is a very difficult job to make a, a prediction about the future of the uh, international system. 
One convenient way of making production may be drawing out from the international theories, such as uh, so-called hegemonic stability theory uh, developed by Charles Kindleberg. He focused on the absence of the uh, international public goods provider uh, and uh, there was no major power which was willing and capable uh, of providing international public goods in the 1930s. And some people may say that uh, we are heading for the 1930s because we lacked uh, the providers of international public good. Uh, the United States and uh, China, uh, two major power, are not interested in taking that kind of uh, role. And uh, some people may say that we are heading for the 1930s in international history for various reasons. There are a rising uh, populism in the world. Uh, I mean, democracy is failing here and there. And there are rising protection. And many countries are adopting bigger than neighbor policies in terms of economic protectionism. And many people are worried about coming uh, I mean, uh, recession. And also, uh, I mean, international, the power of international institution has been weakening, and President Trump is destroying, I mean, some major international institutions. Uh, probably one uh, major uh, positive difference from the 1930s may be the ironic, it is ironic, but the existence of nuclear uh, weapons, which may stabilize uh, international sit situation to some extent. Uh, but those two big leading countries, China, the United States, uh, has not found yet any kind of modus vivendi, which is very different from the relationship between the United States and the Soviet Union in the Cold War period. So my question is, uh, what is your view on that kind of pessimistic uh, I mean, prediction? Uh, so as the question just indicated, there are a number of people who have pointed to so certain similarities uh, between the 1930s and today. I think most of them focusing around uh, the challenge that democracies are currently facing, as many democracies did in the 1930s, the fragility of the international financial system, the sort of movement away from uh, a more liberal trading order to more protectionism, which still has not gone too far, but could easily continue in, in a variety of places. Uh, and then the emergence of populism, you know, what took the form of fascism in the 1930s. Uh, I don't think we have any genuinely fascist parties yet anywhere, but certainly there are some political developments that seem at least similar to what uh, we saw in some uh, places in the 1930s and ultimately led to the uh, great disaster of World War II. Um, so there are uh, fortunately some important differences. Uh, you mentioned the existence of nuclear weapons. Uh, uh, it's a stabilizing force, but uh, also something that worries uh, many of us as well. Uh, but there are a couple of other things uh, too. Uh, in the 1930s, there were four revisionist powers, serious revisionist powers in the world who really wanted to change the international status quo in a very big way. Uh, they wanted to conquer other parts of the world or they wanted to fundamentally alter political relations around the world. You had the Soviet Union under a revolutionary uh, party. You had Nazi Germany uh, where Adolf Hitler's explicit program was to overturn the map of Europe. You had Mussolini's Italy, which had various imperial ambitions in a variety of places, and you had imperial Japan. So you have four countries uh, that actively wanted to change the international status quo in a big way. And I don't see that same situation today. There are some countries that have certain ambitions, but they're nowhere near as extensive uh, or as dangerous. Uh, that's reassuring. That could change, but that's somewhat reassuring. Um, 
Second, the, the 1930s was an era of multipolarity. There were many great powers, um, and uh, IR theorists generally believe that multipolar orders are actually less stable. They're much more prone to miscalculation, uh, to alliances not forming rapidly enough to stop an aggressor, uh, not being clear who the greatest threat might be at any given point. By contrast, bipolar worlds, where there are only two major powers, have lots of rivalry within them, but are also relatively stable because each of the two great powers knows that the other one is likely to oppose any serious attempt that it makes to change the status quo. You know, if the United States and China end up as the two great powers, China will know that if it tries to do anything really big and dangerous in Asia, the United States will try to stop them. And the United States will know, or at least should know, that if it tries to do anything that really threatens Chinese interests, China will stop them. And paradoxically, that certainty that the other is likely to oppose them should lead each side to be relatively cautious. Right? So for that reason, this situation may not be ideal, may not be perfect, may not be as good as we thought it was going to be 25 years ago, but it may not be quite as bad as life was in, say, 1935, 36, 37, and the run-up to World War II. At least I hope I'm right there. <laughs> Thank you very much. Uh, actually, the, uh, the, one of the big reasons why we are having this kind of the, the speech and discussion is not just adding up information or knowledge, but it's building up the collective wisdom and collective intelligence, with the, well, which will be needed badly, especially in, in the Korean society. We do need the, the collective, the consensus, and collective wisdom to navigate the very challenging uh, international situations. So in, in that sense, I, I appreciate your the comments and also the, uh, the wisdom uh, from the renowned uh, the scholars and, and uh, intellectuals. Okay, well, without further ado, uh, let me uh, move to the question. I, I, I got a couple dozen questions, but I, I found out, uh, I try to find out some common denominator and some keywords. So I, I, will, uh, I will use the, uh, I, I, in a sense, filtered and, and, and translated in, into a couple of common questions. And uh, the first set of questions, I would say, to fairly say, first set of question is about the Korea's choice between China and the U.S. And also they did this comment oh, what was partly raised by the, uh, uh, the ambassador, the Egyptian ambassador to, to Korea. Uh, but, but not just the, the one question, but a number of the question they asked, well, mention about the Korean situation. Korea may need, and Korea does need maintaining a good economic ties with China on the one hand. But, but most of all, we have a very strong alliance with the United States. So would it be compatible to have a secure military and, and security alliance with the US on the one hand and maintaining strong and deeper economic relation with China? Um. <clears throat> So uh, obviously the ideal situation for Korea would be to be able to have a profitable, uh, beneficial economic ties with China and lots of other countries and yet make sure that its security is still uh, guaranteed in various ways. That would be ideal. Uh, and I hope that's what happens. Um, but that may not be possible. Uh, and the thing to remember here is that ultimately security is more important than economics. And the answer is really simple. Uh, it doesn't help you to be rich if you've lost your life or you've lost your independence. 
right? And so the first thing to guarantee is your security, and then hope that at the same time you can also be as prosperous as possible. And that's not just true for Korea, that's true for everyone. Uh, countries have to prize their security first and foremost, and then try to accomplish all of the other objectives they have. Um, and the, the reason why I believe um, that the maintaining the security partnership with the United States is in Korea's interest is that ultimately the alternative, if that partnership is lost and the United States is no longer as engaged in Asia, the alternative, assuming China continues to become more powerful, will ultimately be some form of subordination. Uh, not that China is necessarily going to attack uh, Korea or invade or turn it into a colony, uh, but it would want a position of deference from Korea where Korea can't do various things that China might want it to do. And we've seen a few signs of how that might work uh, in recent years when China has been unhappy with steps that Korea has taken. Now, it seems to me from Korea's own point of view, if one does not want to have to call up Beijing and ask permission all the time, uh, Korea will want to maintain a re security relationship with the United States, will want the United States to be actively engaged in Asian affairs, and very importantly, Korea will also want to have as good relations as possible with other countries in Asia that are in the same position that you're in. Right? And I think that's ultimately what will happen. Uh, uh, now, I should say I'm not entirely objective about this uh, because I did write a book about alliances a, a long time ago which said that states do balance against threats and they don't bandwagon with powerful and threatening states. Uh, so if Korea makes a different decision, you're going to disprove the argument of my book and I'll be very unhappy about it. Okay, so uh, I, I was actually want, wondering whether to go for the, the IR theory question or a more policy question, but somehow I think the, the IR theory question would be more relevant. And also the question was, was raised by my uh, dear colleague, the, uh, Professor Sin Hart Lee from Korea University. But uh, it, it also, the, uh, the couple uh, with many other the other question, especially on, on IR theories, and realism and liberalism. So we are nowadays witnessing the decline of, of liberal international, well, liberalism or the, well, whatever, liberal institutionalism. And especially in the midst of the, the deteriorating the U.S.-China relation, or we may say the intensifying U.S.-China the major hegemonic competition. So, uh, and you have mentioned nationalism and growing populism. So, in, in, so if we have to choose a certain theory, the primary theory to, to look into the situation, then can the realist theory vis-a-vis -vis other, uh, other international relations theory still relevant and effective to explain and predict the current uncertain international relation is um, so uh, realism is the worst theory of international politics except for all the others <laughs> right it, it's not perfect but it tells you i think a lot of very important things about how the world works uh, and if you use realist theory, if you think like a realist, uh, lots of things that have happened in the world in recent years are very easy to understand. And they're rather hard to explain from other theoretical perspectives, especially uh, liberalism. So if you're a realist, it's easy to understand why Russia reacted as it did to NATO expansion, right? Uh, and realists back in the 1990s said, you know, if you expand NATO, you're not gonna create peace in Europe, you're actually going to make the security situation worse in Europe because Russia will react to it. It will see it as threatening. You may not think you're threatening Russia, but that's irrelevant. Russia will think you're threatening Russia, and that has come to pass. If you think like a realist, it's easy to understand why the United States and China aren't as friendly as they used to be. 
as China's power has increased. Um, if you think like a realist, you can understand why Syria and Iran cooperated to make life difficult for the United States when it invaded Iraq. Right, why did they do that? Because the United States had invaded Iraq and was making it clear that Iran and Syria were going to be next. And so Syria and Iran had an incentive to make sure we failed in Iraq so that we wouldn't come after them as well. I could go on and on and on here, but there are many things. Uh, if you think like a realist, you can understand why when the financial crisis hit and then it affected the European Union and we had a crisis over the euro, why suddenly the Europeans found it hard to cooperate to solve that problem. That suddenly people weren't looking to Brussels to solve their problems. The Germans wanted Germany to solve the problem for Germans. The Greeks wanted someone to solve the problem for Greece. They acted uh, in essentially a realist uh, fashion. So it's not a perfect theory. There's things it doesn't explain particularly well. Uh, really powerful countries, can the, like the United States, can sometimes ignore the lessons of realism for a long time uh, and make mistakes and get into trouble uh, in various ways and still uh, kind of uh, get away from it. Uh, but I do think it's still the best initial way of thinking about how world politics works. Uh, let me just say one or two things about liberalism. I do think th that liberal theories... Uh, tell us something uh, about the world, about how uh, states conceive of interests, uh, how, uh, for example, democratic states are more prone to cooperate, and alliances among democratic states tend to last longer uh, than others uh, do. But the three big parts of liberal theory aren't very powerful, aren't very useful. Uh, democratic peace theory, this idea that democracies don't fight each other, uh, has never really been adequately tested. The evidence to support it, I think, is uh, quite weak. Um, this liberal idea that states that are economically tied together uh, won't fight each other or won't fall into conflict. Uh, there are many exceptions uh, to that, World War I being an obvious case. Whenever civil wars break out, it's a violation of that principle uh, as well. And if you look at what's now happening uh, between the United States and China, these are two economies that are closely linked, but it's not preventing us from seeing each other uh, as rivals. And then finally, there's this argument, uh, again, part of liberal theory about the role of institutions. And let me be clear, I think institutions are very important in world politics. They're very useful tools that states can use to advance their interests. But institutions cannot stop states from fighting each other or being rivals. The United Nations could not stop the United States from going after Iraq. Uh, when it wanted to. International institutions haven't been able to prevent conflicts in Ukraine or in Syria or elsewhere as well. So there are real limits to what institutions can do. Again, I don't want to suggest that liberal approaches have no value at all, but at the end of the day, I think thinking like a realist is more useful. Thank you very much. And. Uh the next set of question, next keyword, a lot of, well, and, and I almost got almost a dozen the, the question on, on, on this keyword. This time the keyword is Japan. Because the uh, nowadays, Korea-Japan relation, well, Korea-Japan relation had been, has been some, somewhat like a season, with some warm season, uh, not that often hot, very hot, but warm, cold, cool, etc., etc. But nowadays it, it is turning into some sort of ice age. So uh, the setup the, uh, regarding this this Korea Japan relation, the question is basically how, especially in in the aftermath of. The, the abolition of GSOMIA from the Korean side. What is the first, what is the U.S. kind of the perspective? Well, what is the, the U.S. standpoint on, on maintaining Korea, Japan, and U.S. trilateral, the alliance, and, and to what extent that is in, 
important in, in maintaining the, the U.S. security policy. And if, if really Korea and Japan are drifting, well, drifting apart, then what will be the U.S. The, uh, response and strategy to cope with, with that situation? Um, well, it's, I think it's pretty clear that from an American perspective, what has happened between Korea and Japan in the last year or so is, is quite unfortunate. Uh, the American view would be this is not good for Japan, it is not good for Korea, and it's also not good for the United States, uh, given our interest in maintaining strong partnerships among countries that also get along with each other. All right, that makes for a much more effective balance of power here in Asia. So what's happened is obviously something the United States didn't want to see and would like to find ways to try and, and reverse. My own view, and now I'm speaking uh, without deep knowledge and only on my own behalf, not a representative of the U.S. government or anyone else, is that this is a case where both uh, Korea and Japan have overreacted to a set of situations. It was a judicial decision here in Korea. Regardless of what the merits of that decision was, uh, it was going to have a negative effect, but I believe Japan overreacted to it. And then in response to the Japanese reaction, uh, the government of Korea has overreacted to that and we're now in a worse situation. And the question is, is this as bad as it's going to get? Right? And now we will gradually see an improvement over time. Or is it going to get worse because one side or the other begins to take additional steps? This is obviously something that the United States does not want to see happen. I am hoping that the Trump administration gets very uh, busy talking to Seoul and talking to Tokyo and hopefully getting the two to start talking to each other uh, again in a more uh, constructive fashion. I think the United States can help. But this is not something the United States can impose on these two allies, as important as they are and as important as the United States is to both of them. We can't order the two countries to get along. We can suggest it, we can nudge them towards it, but ultimately that's a, a decision for these two societies and these two political systems to work out. And as I said in response to the earlier discussion of nostalgia, I believe it would be tragic if some terrible events that happened more than 80 years ago or 70 years ago were continuing to shape the future of these two countries well into the 21st century. Um, at some point we have to be able to put the past behind us, not forgetting it, Right, continuing to respect it, but not allowing it to drive our policies in foolish ways going forward. The United States can help on that, but we're not going to be able to do this alone. Thank you. Uh, I actually have just, just, just two more questions, Seth. And, and, and the next set is, is, is actually about the, uh, the Korea-U.S. alliance itself. Because... And some, some questions were very polite and some were quite, the, the, quite straightforward. And uh, well, there might be two different the, the group of people who will define the alliance. And, and maybe one group will say the alliance, the core of alliance is a value and value and belief and, and, and common, common objective. And more realist, not just the IR realism, but more kind of realist or commercial-minded people will say, alliance, what are you talking about? The core of alliance is money. Money is important too. So uh, uh, recently, uh, and, and, and I guess most Koreans believe that the Korea-U.S. alliance is solid, rock solid, and, and we are sharing the common value. And Korea is spending already pretty high amount, pretty, pretty substantial amount of a defense budget on, on, on those issues. But uh, oftentimes, the, the issue of defense dividend popping up, is popping up, and, and the U.S. Is, is demanding the 
a much larger scale of defense dividend. So, and, and sometimes some, some Koreans may wonder, do the United States really need and want South Korea in, in the alliance scheme? Or, or is Korea still in, in the primary kind of alliance line or maybe 1.5 or, or, or the, the, the second line of defense alliance in, in the Asia Pacific? So what, what is the, the, your viewpoint? Uh, uh, please don't misinterpret this analogy. Uh, but this is a little bit like when my children want to know which one of them I love the most. Right. And, and my wife and I have uh, two children, and we've never answered that question. Uh, so, so they don't know. Uh, uh, and the United States is, does not want to uh, have a hierarchy of allies in Asia, where these are you know, more important than others. For one thing, the importance of a particular ally may vary over time, depending on what's happening in the rest of the security environment. Uh, the point is we would like to maintain uh, close relations with all of them and, as I said before, have all of them get along with each other uh, as much as possible. Uh, I'll just say a couple of quick things. I believe, uh, as a realist, again, that it's primarily common interests that hold an alliance together. Having common values helps smooth things, it reinforces it, but if the common interest, and in my view mostly a common threat, isn't there, the alliance is not going to be very cohesive. Its purpose uh, tends to, to vanish uh, pretty quickly. Uh, and as I've already indicated, I think there are still very powerful common interests bringing the United States and Korea together, uh, regardless of what individual mistakes different leaders uh, might make. Uh, second, uh, any alliance like this also will experience various uh, points of friction at various moments over uh, whether or not everybody is bearing the right share of the common burden. Uh, that's a familiar problem in almost all alliances uh, over time. Uh, in uh, the case of Korea, uh, basing arrangements have been a point of friction in the past. Uh, trying to work out a common policy towards North Korea, sometimes that's been easy, sometimes there have been disagreements. There's nothing new about these things. They have been true of our alliance uh, for many years. And the solution for them is always, you know, sort of goodwill and energetic and sophisticated diplomacy, talking to each other, being patient, listening carefully, and then working out arrangements that meet both of our countries' interests. Um, I believe that managing America's Asian alliance networks is not easy to do now for a variety of reasons. And the principal challenge is political and diplomatic, not military. In other words, maintaining this alliance is not about you know, sending a few more American ships to the Pacific, a few more planes, a few more missiles, a few more troops. That's not the most important thing. The most important thing is sending a few more diplomats who understand security problems in Asia, can talk to people here, can listen to them with a knowledgeable and sympathetic ear. This is primarily a diplomatic task for the foreseeable future. And I think that's something we ought to be able to do uh, without too much difficulty. And I'm sometimes puzzled why the Trump administration is not doing a better job of that. Thank you. Uh, the last question. And, and also, I, I like this question because it also go together with the one, one of the key pillars of Che Institute for Advanced Studies. We are working, we, we are dealing with a lot of geopolitical issues, but at the same time, we are exploring the technical innovation and enhancement. And, and also, we are trying to link the both. So the, the last question uh, is, well, is asking how technological, new technology is impacting the shape of democracy, national identity, and international relations. Well, well, nowadays we are seeing the AI revolution and well, all, all different kinds of, of very fast well, scientific innovation. 
will that effect, will that affect the uh, international, the shape of, of international relations in the future? I, I, I guess that will be a very meaningful question. <clears throat> That's a great question for which I will not have a particularly good answer. Uh, but I'll say a couple of things. As, as I indicated, uh, forecasting the state of technological capabilities is something we're terribly bad at. Um, uh, as I said, the record of inaccurate forecasts, even by very knowledgeable people, uh, you know, Bill Gates said a lot of really stupid things, it turns out, about what computers were going to be able to do and what he was going to be able to do with them. Uh, because it's impossible to anticipate all of the things that human beings may figure out uh, how to do. Uh, nonetheless, I think we do know enough that, that what has happened in the last 25 to 30 years has had a profound political impact. And the most obvious example of this is the rise of social media and how that has both empowered people in a variety of ways, but has also uh, empowered uh, authoritarian governments in a number of places, uh, and how it has brought to the fore political forces that we haven't seen in a long time. Uh, you know, were it not for Twitter, Donald Trump would not be president, in my view. That was critical to his ability to mobilize a certain amount of political support and put his various political rivals uh, in a position where they really couldn't respond effectively. He was better at doing that than they were uh, in a variety of ways. Um, I also believe that the pace of technological change is part of what is pushing this desire for nostalgia that we talked about earlier. It's a desire to, for people to regain control. Things are changing too rapidly. Whole, uh, whole sectors of the economy are being wiped out, not over 50 years, but over five years. Right? Whether you're a, a cab driver who loses your job because of Uber, um, or you're a long distance truck driver, right, who loses your job because we get uh, self-driving trucks in the next few years as well. And you can think of more and more examples of this as well. It's the pace of change that leads people to say, I want the political system to intervene and stop it, to restore what used to exist. So I think it's absolutely appropriate that the Che Institute uh, study this problem. Please figure it out and let me know what the answer is. <laughs> Thank you very much. We will be working on it because, as I mentioned already, the uh, well, the the big aim of the Che Institute is, is not just the uh, building information database, but actually building the, the collective wisdom and collective intelligence that will, will give a navigation for our next generation. In that sense, technological innovation will be the. Uh, would be truly the essential part of it. And um, I think we have yeah, navigated all, all, all these the questions and, and, and answers. And well, just a couple of weeks ago, well, I, I was in a long distance flight and, and well, taking advantage of the, this slide, yeah, the, well, the technology, I, I put some, some readers in, in, in my tablet and then somehow I came across your I remember, it, was it foreign affairs or foreign policy? But uh, well, you have mentioned, in a sense, criticized that the U.S., the, the Washington D.C. think tanks and, and, and those kind of the, the, the intellectual hubris, the, and and mentioned unrepentant uh, neocons and, and uh, unchastened international or oh, liberal inter, or internationalist. Yes. And uh, this morning, I was giving a ride to my daughter to school, and I just asked, just, just out of curiosity, okay, my dear, between unrepentant and unchastened, which is a bigger sin? And without hesitation, she said, unrepentant. And why? Because he or she might have knew it, but didn't correct it. So being unrepentant is, might be a bigger sin. I, I will not claim which side 
it well committed a bigger sin in in the past in, 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 nowadays or in the future but the thing is somehow it might be the right time to look back what we have decided what us has decided what the korea has decided and some at some point we have to be repentant and think about look back what we have done and what we have done wrong and right and also at the same time we need to be chastened more disciplined and more much more flexible and nice to deal with all these kind of challenging issues so once again going back to your, the, the my first kind of the impression and my i don't know why but somehow i sort of the road not taken we are at a crossroad and which road to go with the road there are road taken and there are road untaken at some moment the united both the united states and korea may have to take the road not taken but we have we may have to wait well, we ha actually we have to take it with, with courage and wisdom and for and for the, those future decisions. I once again on behalf of Che Institute, I appreciate your deep insight and, and, and wisdom and, and thank you very much the sharing your time and energy with us and, and that will give uh, that will be a much bigger energy for our next generation. Once again, thank you very much.